Hey everyone, this is Dr. Maples. We're here with our last section on our social epidemiology lecture series. And in this one, we're gonna talk about HIV. We're gonna learn more about its history than probably all of you will know. And we're also gonna spend some time thinking about what this virus is, get learn some statistics on it, how we catch it, and what this means for the future. Now, HIV is a really good example of social epidemiology. And it's also a great example of a culture-bound syndrome because you can see in several cases how we interact with our environment shaped how this disease spreads. Now, a great universal question is where HIV came from. Um, it's before your time, but those of us who were alive in the 1980s when HIV first popped up, we thought it was a brand new thing, but that actually turned out to not be the case. In fact, HIV had been around for far longer than we might have thought. The exact origins aren't clear. But the researchers over the last 40 years have now established that they think this came from a mutation from something that was called SIV or a simian immunodeficiency virus, uh, which was an epidemic that was impacting wild apes as early as, are you ready for this, the 1870s. So this is something that had been around for a very long time and made a jump. Now we need to talk about how that jump is because there's a lot of myths about how that happened. Um, so pay close attention to this because we'll give you some useful knowledge. So the earliest cases of HIV that we've been able to find are in Kinshasa, which is in the Congo, and that would be in the 1910s. That is 70 something years before American scientists thought it had started uh, when we first really were seeing HIV. Um, so it's been in the world species for quite some time. And honestly, the way that that probably started was because of the way we were interacting with our environment. People would slaughter animals, um, which included apes for meat. And the slaughtering process involves interacting with a lot of blood. Um, I don't know if you've ever maybe done something like dress a deer or even carve a chicken, but the chances of interacting with an animal's blood, especially if it's freshly killed, is very high. Um, and then another weirdly weird thing happens with being a butcher. We find that when you are handling knives um, with a lot of blood, that knives slip a lot. And so it's very easy to simply nick your finger while you're cutting stuff like that and getting exposed to it. It's no different than when you're cutting an onion and you might accidentally cut yourself a little bit and the onion oil gets in there and you're like, ah, it burns or peppers or anything. Well, it's the same thing here. People probably were accidentally nicking themselves with knives or worse and getting exposed to it. And this is probably where SIV made its first jump into HIV. And then things kind of got really strange. Colonialism was a huge shaping force in HIV. So again, a culture bound syndrome because the way our society was organized was in colonies, even in the 1950s in certain places. And so um, the spread of antibiotic use, which was kind of like a miracle wonder drug to treat everything from syphilis to all sorts of different sicknesses um, in the 1950s, we didn't really understand how bad an idea it was to um, reuse needles. Uh, and so people were reusing needles to administer antibiotics without them being fully sterilized. Today we dispose of needles, uh, but back then reusable needles was a thing and they weren't getting sterilized really well. As part of the antibiotics craze, they were spreading HIV amongst different people. Um, likewise, too, this was, um, you know, just different uses for antibiotics, including sleeping sickness and all sorts of other stuff. Um, now, what we started to see over time from there is as the United States and the entire globe become increasingly linked together, um, ports always end up being where diseases first start to pop up. And with, um, you know, things like... Um, uh, HIV, it was no exception. So let's think back to the Black Plague for a moment. We talked about that in our last lecture. Ports were a really common place of, of getting the Black Plague because basically people on the ship would have um, rats because rats get on boats no matter what. It's just going to be part of it back then. Um, if they were infected with fleas, then eventually the fleas would get the Yersinia pestis bacteria. People would be bitten. And then when the ports would land, they maybe wouldn't necessarily be put into a period of quarantine. And so the stuff coming off of there would would have the rats and fleas which get spread to the whole community people that were sick could come and spread it was just a big problem well the same thing happened with hiv we think that um probably in the late 70s or maybe slightly earlier we started to see HIV really getting rooted into California, and it by chance landed in the port of San Francisco, which is an important port, but it also, by coincidence, had a very high population of gay males. And this was interesting because what ends up happening in the late 70s is we start to see otherwise perfectly healthy gay males 
starting to get something called the Kaposi sarcoma. So Kaposi sarcoma was a skin cancer that we only saw often in people who were middle-aged and were coming from a very particular part of Europe that included Italy, Mediterranean area. Um, it just didn't pop up in young people. It wasn't something that was did that because it often was linked to either genetics or it was linked to being uh, having a very weak immune system. And it didn't make sense that all these really young males who are in their, you know, 18s, 19s, and even to their early 20s and 30s, who should be in the prime of their health and be fully healthy, were suddenly not thriving and in fact started dying of this wasting disease at a very rapid clip. This freaked out the entire nation because if you can imagine how COVID has been a nightmare for the United States, HIV was treated very similarly. Um, and it was also very politically engaged, much like COVID is. So what you're experiencing is a kind of similar to what we were experiencing then. Now, our first experiences with documenting HIV, uh, the first official diagnosis comes in May of 1980. And by 1984, four years later, um, which I remember when that happened, HIV is first actually declared as being, you know, identified as the cause. They, they finally understood exactly what virus was causing it. I can't stress enough that this was a strange period of time because um, people were using the phrase gay cancer to describe HIV as a, a medical term. Um, and in fact, they even had a couple of other terms that were being used and you would hear this in the news. And so it resulted in a period of time in which people were isolating um, persons who were gay um, and persons who would experience this disease. Um, even people who were getting it because we didn't understand that it was bloodborne. And so people who were getting it through um, uh, transfusions were likewise being isolated. And it was a very strange experience. And it largely came down to the fact that we just didn't understand how it was being spread. But social epidemiologists were a really important part of that, trying to understand what this virus was doing, how it worked, and more. In fact, so much of the information that we have today from this virus, even information that we're using to deal with COVID, comes from social epidemiologists. So what I want to do is, now that we've kind of explored some of the history of this disease, I want to define what it is. I want to tell you a little bit about how it works. And I think hopefully this will give you a little bit of a sense of it took us all this time to get all this information about HIV so you can understand it's going to take us several years to understand COVID. Um, uh, we have far better technology now um, than we did back then, but it's just going to take time to understand that. So with HIV, um, HIV stands for the Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It is separate from AIDS. It actually, HIV is the human, emission, emission, the human immunodeficiency virus, and that can lead to AIDS. So we can generally use the phrase HIV rather than saying HIV AIDS, and we certainly can use the phrase HIV rather than AIDS. AIDS would actually be the third stage of the progression of HIV. Um, AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Understand that as HIV goes through its different stages, it impacts the body differently. We'll talk about those stages in just a moment. But once a person gets to this third stage in which they're identified as being in that third stage of HIV AIDS, um, this is the final stage. This is where we have months, today's, weeks, uh, maybe years, but this is where things are, are at the end of uh, their life most likely. So that's why there's a slight difference in saying HIV AIDS, saying AIDS, and saying HIV. We generally can simply say HIV because that is the virus, and AIDS is a specific category of being in the third category that we're talking about. The bulk of people with HIV are not in the AIDS category, so that's also useful to remember. Uh, in fact, nearly uh, uh, the bulk of people with HIV are in the first and second categories. We'll come to find out. Now, um, HIV follows a very clear, predictable three-stage production uh, process. Um, the first one is what we call stage one. It's acute infection. The acute infection is a period of time in which you are first infected with this virus. And this is routinely um, described as something that is the worst flu ever. That was the definition before COVID, so fair warning for that. Um, but it's, it's something where people are like, this is a disease that you catch it. You don't understand what it is, but it puts you on your back for a couple of weeks. You feel very sick. You feel very weak. 
Um, and what's happening at this stage is that you've been exposed to HIV. We'll talk about the ways that you can be exposed to HIV in a moment. And it's going through this process of rapidly replicating in the human body. Um, it just surges all of a sudden. And the way that HIV works in this stage is really interesting. You have um, these things called CD4s and CD8s that are part of your immune system response. And um, if I remember correctly, the uh, CD4s talk to the CD8s. I may have that backwards. But they're almost like... Um, linked in by a, a communication system. And um, one is responsible for walking around in your immune system and warning the body when there's a problem. So if it sees a virus, um, like, you know, coronavirus, for example, or the flu or something like that, it would tell the human body to send out attack cells to attack that. Um, but what happens with HIV is it actually breaks down that communication system by invading that cell. And then it just sort of takes it over and then it stops communicating with the rest of the body. So it makes it that your body doesn't know that there's a problem. It weakens that immune system. It may detect it in other places, but it just doesn't um, have the ability to fight it. it. It basically replicates inside that form and recreates itself. And it's interesting, too, because then as this stage wraps up after a couple of weeks, people sort of report getting back to normal and feeling normal again, and they go back to their normal lives. This is actually a weird moment where the HIV virus just kind of goes to sleep. It just kind of stops and has a seat and it hangs out in the human body. And the human body doesn't really understand that it's there fully, so it doesn't really understand how to attack it. Um, and it will go into what we call a latency period. This latency period can last upwards of a decade. It can last multiple decades under medication. Um, people like Magic Johnson, who have had this for decades, um, have been able to stay in stage two for a very long time. Um, but nonetheless, with latency, HIV is there, um, but it just kind of stays quiet, and you're more or less able to live a normal life. This is problematic, though, because this is also a period of time in which you're able to infect other people. In fact, you'll be able to infect other people for the rest of your life at that point because there is no cure to HIV at this time. We'll also talk about that. Now, with HIV um, and this latency stage, it can stay there for a period of time. But over time, the person's health will decline and they start being exposed to viruses that they suddenly can't fight off, like Kaposi sarcoma, things like thrush, things that they normally would be able to fight off but now can't. And this is where we slowly but surely moving into this third stage of AIDS, uh, or third stage of HIV, which we call AIDS, the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. And this is where people start um, getting opportunistic infections that they normally could fight but now can't. And this is also a period of time in which they are near the end of their lives. That's how HIV functions. It's very predictable. When I started doing these lectures about 10 years ago, we had 1.1 million people living with HIV. Since we have seen a surge in opioid use, uh, it's up to 1.2 million and will probably go up much higher in the coming years. I expect this may even go up to 2 million uh, because opioid has had such a high impact on that. That said, we see a lot more people with HIV knowing that they have it. When I started giving these lectures, it was one in five people with HIV didn't know they were infected. We've now moved up to one in eight, but because of opioids, we've gone back down to one in seven. But nonetheless, it's still an improvement. But we have a long way to go. We're also seeing, too, that the stabilization of the rates is more or less happening if we don't account for opioids. We're seeing about 40,000 new cases a year, but with opioids, we expect that's probably going to surge. We do see that the highest infection rates for HIV are in well, your age group, 20 to 24, followed by your next age group, 25 to 29. We also see, too, that our highest infection rates are typically in the South, with Georgia, Florida, and Louisiana being national leaders at any given time. Tennessee and Kentucky also being amongst those. They're um, kind of part of the, uh, the South. Um, Madison and Fayette counties do have moderate to high rates for HIV infection. Uh, Fayette is actually second in the uh, state of Kentucky behind Jefferson. Um, that's because those are our two largest urban areas. So that's probably why the rates are the highest. But Madison uh, has rates that are of concern. So you should keep those in mind as we talk about how you get exposed to this. Note that um, well over a half million people have died from HIV and going into AIDS, that third stage, since the epidemic began. We're somewhere around 675,000. Um, so that's a lot of people. It's interesting, too, because 675,000 and then our COVID deaths may be over 100,000 and increasing. So it kind of puts it all into perspective and in what's happened in one year versus decades. 
All right, so with HIV, you got some very specific ways that you get exposed to this. You avoid these, you have nothing to cons be concerned about. Um, your number one form of contact is going to be anything that involves running into blood or fluid exchanges, um, excluding spit. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, these specifically include blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and including um, infected breast milk, which you're probably not drinking breast milk at your age. And if you are, you probably shouldn't be, but I'm not going to judge. Nonetheless, those are the ways that you're looking at risk. More likely for you, you're looking at blood, semen, and vaginal secretions. Um, sex can be one of the very obvious ways for getting exposed to those. And when I say sex, that includes everything, oral sex, anal sex, any kind of sex that you can consider where it involves blood, semen, or vaginal secretions, uh, you have a risk level there. It does not include saliva. Saliva is not a place that we're seeing it carried. We are seeing um, opportunities for mothers um, who are pregnant to pass HIV over to unborn um, uh, children. There's a pretty high success rate, though, for using drugs to prevent that from happening. Um, so that's one thing to consider. The other one that you are going to look at is sharing needles. Now, I want to be very clear. If you can avoid blood or fluid exchange and avoid sharing needles, you should be fine. You have zero things to be concerned about. If these are things that are happening in your life, you have to be aware that you have the chance of being exposed to this. Um, there are a lot of less common, rare hypothetical cases that people often present, um, but these are so small or even hypothetical that they are something so unlikely that you really don't even need to consider them. You need to focus on blood or fluid exchanges. Um, transfusions, almost nil risk of that today. It was a thing in the early 80s, but not today. Uh, unsafe dental practices. If you have a dentist who is not wearing gloves, you need to tell them to get gloves. If you have a dental technician who's not wearing gloves, masks, and everything, they need to be, particularly in COVID, but even before that. Um, dental practices are a really likely place for getting exposed to blood. Skin wound contact contact is low risk. This was a concern about like basketball and boxing. If one person who had a cut could perhaps spread it to another person or cuts on elbows to faces and stuff. Um, unsafe tattooing. Um, if you see a tattoo artist that is not using a clean needle kit, you need to run. Um, same thing goes for piercings. You need to see them pull that stuff out of the sterilized packaging. Unintentional needle pokes, that was something that happened, but the risk of it is actually fairly low. Interesting story is that HIV doesn't really live well um, outside the human body, so you've got a fairly limited amount of time. Um, it doesn't stick around uh, nearly as much like, say, COVID would. There are hypothetical cases, too, for biting people and getting HIV. When you bite someone, you often bite yourself, um, and there's a really high risk of um, blood overlap there. Um, things that you don't have to worry about, air, insects, thankfully mosquitoes do not spread it because we sure have a lot of them in Kentucky, saliva, tears, sweat, shaking hands, these are things you have zero concerns about. You cannot catch HIV from these. Hugs, high fives, all on the list. If it doesn't involve um, blood or fluid exchange, excluding saliva, you're fine. Closed mouth kissing, also something to consider. Now, there is a hypothetical case for um, open mouth kissing that if you were making out with someone who had some kind of dental issue or they had specifically bleeding gums, bleeding gums can be a risk because um, if your tongue gets a cut on it, as it often can, or your mouth has a cut, as it often can, or even you've bitten your lip and it's got an open cut on the inside and they were to somehow bleed out through the bleeding gums, oh my gosh, this is disgusting to say, can we just all agree not to make out with people that have like bleeding gums? Can we? Let's just all make that promise to ourselves and we don't have anything to worry about. I can't stress that enough. HIV has very clear, specific things. Um, your risks are getting exposed to blood, vaginal or semen secretions, um, and uh, sharing needles. If you avoid those issues, you're fine. You have nothing to concern about. The chances of you getting HIV or being exposed are nil. The odds are so odd that it, low that it just can't happen. It won't happen. Now, there is a good prognosis. Understand that I'm in my 40s, and when I was a child, having HIV in the 80s was a death sentence. You would be dead before the end of the decade. In fact, people were dying in several, you know, five, six years kind of thing, uh, sometimes less if they had uh, particularly bad health or no medical care. Um, today, we do see some exciting things. There's an SAV001H vaccine. Um, it's completed phase one testing. It's going into round two. This was a virus um, uh, vaccine that was 
being used on couples who one person had HIV and another person didn't, and they were using it there to try to limit the spread of HIV from one person to the other. And it was actually having a really good success rate. It's something that we probably will hear a lot more about. You also occasionally hear rare situations where people um, you know, no longer test positive for HIV. That's true. There are rare cases like that. Um, but usually what we see is that if for some amazing reason a person stops testing positive for HIV, if they go off of antiretroviral drugs, they'll eventually test positive again. Um, there's a recent news case of one of the early cases of a person getting a blood a uh, bone marrow transfusion, I believe it was, that um, no longer tested positive for HIV, uh, recently died, but not because of HIV. Um, uh, but, you know, that's like one case out of the millions and millions and millions of people out there. Um, typically, though, we do see this uh, new vaccine possibly being good, but that's not going to be publicly available anytime soon. And it's probably also not going to be something that would be given to the general population. Rather, it would be given to specific situations to people who are maybe in high-risk categories. There is cheery news in the sense that in the United States, an average 20-year-old, you, with timely diagnosis and perfect treatment and no other illnesses, um, can pretty much live a normal life expectancy. Um, if you get their medical care, if you get diagnosed now, you're going to be fine. You're going to live a normal life. You would have HIV. You would have the ability to give it to other people, but you would live a normal life expectancy. When we examine cases individually where people have bad access to health care um, and it's left untreated, they die much sooner. So that's where we stand with HIV. That also wraps up our lecture for the period of time that we are on. We are done with this one. Now we are moving into our last lecture where we're going to talk about rural sociology in the coming days. Uh, so this is one of my favorite areas, which we'll get to talk about Eastern Kentucky. If you have questions about HIV, questions about social epidemiology, if you're interested in jobs in social epidemiology, feel free to get in touch with me. I have some success with students going into this field too, so I can give you my personal experiences with that. If you have questions, I'm here to help. Otherwise, I will see you in our next lecture on rural sociology. Take care.